Welcome to a new episode of Becoming a Post-Growth Planner, Challenges and Obstacles to Changing Roles and Practices. My name is Christian Lamker. I'm Assistant Professor for Sustainable Transformation and Regional Planning at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And today we move outside of Europe, where we look to the global south, and I'm proud that I have Chandrima with me today. Hi, I'm uh, Chandrima Mukhopadhyay. I am. Uh, I have a PhD from um, School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape, Newcastle University, UK. I have been working for Association of European School of Planning's Young Academic Network since 2011. I came back to India in 2014. I have taught at uh, SEPT University, Faculty of Planning, and then I had received a visiting uh, scholarship to attend a fellowship program on MIT UTM, Malaysia Sustainable Cities Program. Then I have worked for a project called Optimism on for from Ahmedabad University, India. And currently I'm the coordinator of the new uh, thematic group of ESOP on Global South and East. Yeah, thank you. So what we're talking about today started actually at the around the ESOP Congress uh, in 2022, this summer in Tartu, Estonia. And the roundtable where Ben Davy and others also raised the question, okay, what does this all mean for the Global South? And as you are the coordinator of the ESOP thematic group on planning theories and practices for the Global South and East, uh, this is a great opportunity to extend our thoughts a bit. So far in this podcast, we have only engaged with scholars from the Global North. So can you maybe briefly summarize for us why it is crucial for us in Europe, the Anglo-American world, to interact with scholars from the Global South? I would make two points. Uh, first of all, a Global North and South, it's quite dynamic in nature, even when you speak about economic development. So the focus is shifting towards Global South also in terms of rapid urbanization. South, South Asia, Africa, China, it, they will lead in terms of urbanization and economic development. Second, um, there are much more complexities to learn from in the Global South. Formality and formality is not a binary, but it's a scale of continuity, continuum in the uh, South. Civil societies are largely working at the interface with the scale of continuum between formality and informality. Development, climate change, sustainable development goals are to be delivered in synergy. There is much more complexities in terms of reducing poverty, addressing climate change, planning for rapid urbanization, public-private interface in the process of urbanization, addressing uncertainties and risk, innovation at the city scale in terms of technology, financing, institution, than you may come across in the global north. In the spirit, I would like to mention that when we had thought about forming the thematic group on Global South and East, one of our arguments was that budding planners in Europe need to learn from the Global South, even if they will be working in Europe. In this light, I find Gabriela Carolini's article, Go South, Young Planners Go South, quite relevant and interesting. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we had some debate last summer also, if post-growth is more an intellectual luxury of the Global North, that has the Global North that has also historically caused most environmental climate destruction. So having this in mind, what are the themes to define post-growth in your own perspective? So I'd like to start with an argument that if post-growth planning is about defined as ignoring economic growth and looking beyond it, then it is not of interest for the countries in the global south, as in spite of everything else, economic growth and economic development remains one of their main agenda. However, there are multiple ways in which post-growth could be defined in the global south by unpacking economic development as a macroeconomic indicator. I believe the following themes are important. So it's reducing inequality, improving quality of life, alternate way of living, and achieving economic development through urbanization, under which environment and ecology is an important factor. So I'll just very briefly go through all of this by just to say what I mean by this. Um, reducing inequality, like increasing inequality doesn't lead to economic development in the long run. Investing in infrastructure development for the vulnerable group will reduce inequality and that would lead to economic development in the long run. There has to be a large scale study, quantitative study to demonstrate this even to policymakers because at times it looks like this point is lost. For instance, India has the aspiration of being amongst the developed, developed economies through urbanization. And each and every socioeconomic group has the aspiration of socioeconomic mobility over generations. 
So all policy and planning related decisions are made keeping these two in mind. However, the long-term goal is to reduce inequality by planning and investing for the vulnerable group. I'll just very briefly quote a senior academic who said, mm -hmm. there is one India and one Bharat. Bharat is the Hindi term for India. And it, all, it also means the larger population who has lesser economic resources. And both as a practitioner, as an, an academic, our aim is to work for Bharat to reduce inequality, to uh, facilitate the socioeconomic mobility of this group. Uh, the second one I mentioned was uh, measuring quality of life. So if post-growth planning means measuring growth only in terms of figures of economic growth, but also in terms of quality of life, then it has already been taken into consideration. For instance, in human development reports. In fact, such a definition has been adopted also by international development organizations and populating the idea that economic growth is just a measure. It doesn't, it's not associated with anyone's inferiority or superiority, along with discarding other terms like third world and developing countries. The third one I said is alternate way of living. So following Western modern ideas, there is material affluence is popularly equated with well-being and happiness. It's deeply rooted in Western society and are increasingly present in global South that did not have access to such resources in the past. As I already mentioned, every socioeconomic group has aspiration of achieving mobility in the, over generations, and um, it will be reflected in their lifestyle. So for the scholars from the North, it is something to learn from the South that there is an alternative lifestyle with lesser economic resources, but improved quality of life. However, um, I mean, which also includes delivering housing and infrastructure, even in informal sector without associating it with a sense of inferiority. However, uh, being an Indian, I strongly still support the aspiration of the socioeconomic groups here to have mobility over generations, including um, having access to material affluence. And what does it mean for the aspirations of these of countries in the global south also to achieve positive development uh, in line with uh, climate change mitigation, sustainable development goals, uh, and also the international frameworks? So, for instance, I'll give you example. So, when we are we are um, working on GHG emission mitigation, or when, when we are working on climate change mitigation, or when we are working on sustainable development goals, there are low income groups now who probably own just in terms of transport, they probably own just a two wheeler, or they are using um, walking long distances because they cannot even afford public transport. But when you are asking them question about what is it, what do we would you like to own in five years, they would like to own a vehicle, a car, a personal car, so that they don't have to do it. So they have this sort of, and it is not only in transport, it's in every sector. So they have this sort of aspiration. And when we are working as planners or policy makers, we are not, um, it is not said that they cannot have it because they did not have it in the past. So they have all the right to have it in future. But then you, I mean, this was this was my second next point I was coming to that we are working towards there is increased economic activity, hence increased uh, mobility, hence increased emission. But the pathway is being taken in a way that it actually also mitigates uh, the emission without compromising on economic activity or without compromising on their lifestyle. How would that work to set more ecological priorities in this course of development with all the challenges? You talk about people who never owned uh, certain types of mobility and have aspirations to, to achieve also the standard of living that most of us have in the global north. Ecological priorities are uh, an important topic of post-growth and post-growth planning. Uh, how would yeah. you see that from your perspective and how is that maybe discussed also the, against the context of countries in the global south? Yeah, so uh, urban planning has always been a multidisciplinary uh, subject and environment was already always part of it. But the way I see it previously, it was about you were developing something and you were concerned about what impact that development would have on the environment. But with climate change and with it, it has become a really serious concern. So I think it's time to prioritize environment in a way. So you are actually building within nature 
and you are building with nature. So there has to be some sort of synergy between the natural environment and the built environment. I had a few examples from Indian context. So just to explain. So um, one was this East Kolkata wetland, which is look a Ramsar site of 12,500 hectare area in the um, East Kolkata metropolitan area and in, on its Eastern boundary. So this was announced a Ramsar site in 2000. 2003. And then because it's a Ramsar site, development was not allowed on the land. But it, there was huge potential for development because the city wanted to grow on that site. So there was huge demand for development and there were illegal development even without um, permission because there was demand for it and it was not being completely monitored. And the wetland is known for its wise use of wastewater and it makes the city an ecologically subsidized city. But with climate change be, becoming an important topic, important concern for the governments, now this wetland is getting attention, much attention in terms of preserving the wetland and not developing on the land. So uh, as a, if you see this from a, through a post growth lens, then this is about prioritizing environmental preservation, prioritizing ecology over achieving short-term economic growth. I mean, I'm sure in the long run, it is there will be economic development and preservation of nature is actually contributing towards this. The second example, if I may just uh, give you another example, I had in mind was, um, so from the thematic group, there is some, uh, someone called Shruti uh, Seal. She is at Virginia Commonwealth University. And she did a research on Delhi, on Delhi's uh, slum areas. And she actually tried to look into how much the slums act are polluting the drainage system. Because there is a myth that slums are should not be there because slums are polluting the environment. But what she found out is slums are actually not polluting the drainage. The drainage, the pollution in the drainage has an impact on the slum. So it's a myth. And being a post-growth planner, you then would not like to destroy slum because it's polluting, because you know that is evidence doesn't show that. Deep insights. Many thanks also for sharing these two examples from uh, your context. Uh, at ASOP 2022, Benjamin Davy asked what post-growth planning would have to say to a single mother in an informal settlement. For example, he had South African townships in mind. Is post-growth planning in the global south maybe closer to the reality of a survival strategy or how can it be a really a future perspective, uh, also something positive toward the future? Yeah, so the way I see it, economic growth and development is an impact rather than an output like an infrastructure uh, in place our outcome like improved education level or improved accessibility of a process. And when it comes to socioeconomic mobility, then it's even long term process. So postcode planning in Global South, in my opinion, is about putting the needs of the vulnerable groups first, rather than a collective economic growth reflected in figures for a region where vulnerable groups' needs are often compromised. Um, Post-growth planning in the Global South will prioritize investing on infrastructure, for instance, on in non-motorized transport that are used by all taking an alternative lifestyle into consideration, for instance, instead of investing on private vehicle infrastructure, uh, so that the vulnerable groups access to transport mobility is improved, leading to socioeconomic, I'm, I mean, their access to trans, uh, employment, education, health, and over time, socioeconomic mobility of generations. And economic growth and development will be achieved in the long run by making the vulnerable groups life better off. We do not live in a time where we can say develop now and take address climate action later. So that has to be taken in synergy. And it is the vulnerable group that are disproportionately affected by climate action in global south. So even at an individual level, they might not have food supply if no action has been taken on climate. And I think it's also about what you mean by uh, technology. So technology plays a very key role, even improving the life of the vulnerable group. So for instance, I'm very, I always cite this example of um, electric three wheelers in India. They are considered a technical solution to provide rapid transit for the vulnerable group, urban poor in terms of affordability, women in terms of safety without compromising on emission. Yes, the global south in itself is rather diverse. And of course, there is no unified planning system or no unified relevance or formalized planning in that. However, 
also the background of the as of thematic group maybe do you recognize some commonalities about the roles of spatial planners in post growth planning against the context of the global south so planning um south africa asia south asia they are uh as per UN Habitat's projection, they are going to experience rapid urbanization in the next um, decade or so. So planning plays a critical role in efficient use of resources in rapid urbanization. And spatial planning plays a key role in ensuring efficient use of resources at varied scales, starting from city form, for example, uh, land use transport integration, to provision of infrastructure at a micro scale, example given, uh, provision deliveries at the community level. So I'll cite some examples. The balance between provision of public transport and non-motorized transport versus private vehicle infrastructure could be a long-term impact on low-income communities. Mobility has already discussed. In the global south, due to restricted mobility, due to restricted access to employment, health, education, um, they miss out the opportunity of socioeconomic mobility. They cannot do a job. They cannot go for education. So that will be resolved. While accessibility to housing and employment has to do with location of housing, design of housing influences whether informal migrant women, and this is an example, so informal migrant women working for home-based enterprises can carry out their home-based work within the household. And these are very large sector because in India, 90% of the employment is in informal sector. So in terms of Another example is in terms of land use, whether the planners working in public sector priorities, locating the local businesses by allotting them in the prime location over the global companies. And special planners have a role to play in each of these. I must mention, civil societies are really working very well with this vulnerable group. So even whatever info, whatever data I have on this, I have got it by interacting with them. So they play a key role, and many civil engineers and planners choose to work for civil societies. So uh, quite a strong plea for our whole profession, uh, also to maybe enhance yeah. our skill set further. Uh, so yeah. for this, what skills of planners are the most relevant? Maybe what should also our focus be at universities, at research yeah. and education, to support also debates between scholars in the Global North and the Global South, uh, about post-growth planning and the common potentials uh, for the future development of uh, cities, of regions, uh, and basically of the whole earth, after all. So in terms of um, the skills, I would first like to mention this. There is a recent literature on vocabularies for planners in in for the South under Southern Theories, which was started by Gautam Bhan. And he introduced three new action-oriented terminologies and he said, every planner working in a Southern context should adopt these terminologies because those terminologies has never been used in the North. They did not, did not require it. But in, if you are working in the Southern context, you will have to adopt these terminologies. The three terms he came up with is a squad as a practice of not just of, for altern, subaltern urbanization, but of the state, repair in contradiction to construct, build, and even upgrade and consolidate rather than focus on the building of a singular universal network within services and infrastructure. During COVID, we published a special issue of Conversation in Planning Booklet Project on Global South, where three young academics, originally from Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil, but they are studying in UK and Australia. So they were working with uh, Vanessa Watson on a chapter related to vocabularies. And they also came up with three new terminologies, which are perverse incentive planning, ingraining, and occupying. Now, budding planners, whether they are going to be either in academia or practice, they have a huge responsibility in building up such vocabularies and use them in their practice. Um, this would be a major step towards becoming a postgraduate planner in a certain context. And it is important for special planners in the Global South to have the skill of working at the info interface of formal and informal sector because formalizing the informal is never the solution. How to work both as, as and with civil societies. However, I feel the vocabulary is, it is such a broad, it provides a broad umbrella that it covers all of these aspects. And how does this play out with the ecological priority that is part of post-growth? I'm living here. So you see what's happening around you. And that made me think about that um, there has to be 
the planners will also have to have some basic understanding of ecologists. As a discipline, ecologists has been looked down because they are not considered the technocrats. But this approach cannot be um, carried forward if you really want to address climate change and plan in a time when climate change is such a big concern. I'll just give one example. Gurgaon is a city in national capital region based on IT industry. It has the most expensive real estate. But with a couple of hours, very heavy rain, the whole road were submerged underwater. Traffic could not move overnight. Cars were floating in the parking lot and banging on each other. And if you ask the built environment professional, they are saying there is problem with drainage. I think it's much more than problem with drainage. Only provision of drainage would not resolve this. And these are new cities, new developments that has been built in the middle of an empty area. So they should have the basic understanding of ecologies while site planning, doing site planning, how you are doing. And nature has to be more brought into built environment. So, so just like um, ecosystem services has to be applied. And so, there are, I mean, there are work being done on that. Yeah, so what do we then have to, uh, to do or what do we have to focus on to become post-growth planners in the global south? So postgraduate planner, from this ecology perspective, they will have to have a fair basic understanding of ecology and when, even if the focus is on built environment, how they can apply those skills into while working on the built environment. I just had a last point on uh, to become a postgraduate planner. So this to become a postgraduate planner in the Global South at a time where private sector plays a significant role in planning with profit-oriented interest. One has to widen their scope or view for instance, displacement has been considered as something that you don't discuss in a planning program. You are planning, you are developing, and that is why displacement will happen, and that is quite taken for granted. But um, very recently, started by the Southern theorist, but also it has been taken up by many um, institutes in the North. It is acknowledged that by Southern theorists that a specific pattern of urbanization and planning creates displacement. Oren Yevchil has even coined the term displaceability. So it's not already displaced, but there is potential for displacement. And many planning programs, they have um, they are speaking about it. So a postgraduate planner, while being aware of new set of vocabularies, as we already discussed, would know how to plan while minimizing displacement and widen their view a little bit from yeah. the built environment towards natural environment, but also what is they are planning, but as a result of their planning, what is being created? Yeah. So universities are certainly a great place to foster such uh, widening of perspectives, of yeah. knowledge, of skills. Uh, yeah. So what should our focus be at universities then? I thought exchange ideas about reducing inequality, new pathway for development in the global south, using new sets of vocabularies, prioritizing ecologies. These are important things. I mean, scholars from north who are not often engaged with planners from the South, they wouldn't know about the innovating planning practices and development pathways that the uh, Southern countries are following if they're not engaged with scholars from Southern countries. Uh, similarly, I got to know about post growth planning as a concept because the Ben Jevi introduced you all in the thematic group. So there are certain issues like that are universal, like reducing inequality, climate change. We are speaking about that in the South. You are also speaking about that in the North. So there are these uh, common uh, topics. So I would say with collaboration and exchange of ideas on these areas would advance the concept of post-growth planning in general. Yeah, perfect. It's also great to have you here in this podcast, uh, So, which is also part of uh, also my own exchange in that way. As uh, So far, I have much talked about post-growth and planning in, in Europe or a bit beyond Europe, but not really into the Global South. Also because... My own concerns, I'm not living there, I don't have experience there. Uh, so therefore, uh, I feel it's also most responsible to have you and others who are deep into these contexts into the integrated in the debate and share your knowledge, your examples, and that we can also all benefit from that. And hopefully also towards the next years, continue these debates and make it to a more uh, international, equal and global debate on how post-growth and planning can enrich each, each other, not only in Europe, not only in the Anglo-American countries, but uh, at a much more global scale.
having in mind also all the regional, national, local differences that we all value and that uh, we should, of course, keep in this quest. To come to an end of this podcast episode, uh, I would like to ask you to finish the sentence as in all other episodes of the, this podcast, but maybe a bit different focus towards the global south. So if you finish the sentence, post-growth planning in the global south is... Um, reducing inequality by prioritizing the development and investment for the vulnerable groups, practicing based on new set of vocabularies, and prioritizing environment and ecology. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Chandrima, for joining me today, and thanks for sharing examples, insights, and all the background that you develop within the ethics thematic group, your own research over quite some time, and also looking forward to more to come. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.